morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Access Online in person. Uh, if you got a bulletin, if you're in person, that's a place where you can connect with us. Also, there's a QR code in front of some of your seats there that you can also connect um, that way as well. Um, and then online, you can connect with us through accessnows.com. Message us, comment on the Facebook that you're watching on right now. Um, so just one thing I want to keep reminding you is this Tuesday is normally our food bank giveaway. So we're not having it. Bread of Life is taking a few weeks off. I think they actually have a, a fireworks booth yes. somewhere. Where is their fireworks booth? We should probably promote that. I feel like this mic's coming in and out. What's that? West Lane. Oh, it's at West Lane? So West Lane Bowl, um, if somebody else is selling fireworks, I apologize in advance for what I'm about to say. Go to West Lane Bowl, West Lane Bowl, and buy a firework. <laughs> <laughs> or promote it yourself after church somewhere else. Uh, if you, how many of you are doing fireworks? Is Michael still doing the fireworks out there? Oh, we're not doing that no more. Who, who's doing fireworks? I saw some hand. You're going to do fireworks? Outside your house? Outside of somebody else's okay. house. Somebody else's house. Okay. I know where Ray lives. That'll attract the police officers. So. And I'm a police chaplain, so I feel duty-bound to tell you um, that you will not get caught. <laughs> so uh, have fun. Well, maybe have Unless it catches fire, fire. <laughs> then you will. Well, even if it catches on fire, it's just the fire department. So you're fine. There you go. It's good. Uh, I'm on call this week, so I would appreciate uh, let your neighbors know. Calm it down. I don't want to get uh, disturbed from my barbecue to come out to your crime scene. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I just landed that way this year. So that's exciting. That'll be fun. Uh, but anyways, uh, we're celebrating freedom this weekend. And do you know how I know this? Uh, because our city sounds like a war zone. Amen? Right? Yeah. yeah, we've been celebrating it. I think people think like you can start celebrating it June 1st. I mean, June 4th to August 4th, right? Uh, that's a lot of money going up in the sky. I don't know about you, but oh my gosh. Mark and I see with our windows open, and last night I was like, whew, my goodness. That's a whole lot of ammunition going on out there, right? Or whatever it is. It was loud, right? We celebrate freedom. So I wanted us to spend some time talking about freedom, but more importantly, the freedom that we have because of God. Because we celebrate freedom because God of the universe is all about freedom. Not the freedom that we've made it. We're gonna, I'm going to kind of turn this upside down because you know what? Jesus always did that. Jesus turned everything upside down, right? Mm -hmm. And so I want us to talk about freedom, but I want us to talk about the freedom that God has given us. And the freedom for what? Right? Because I think we, we have a misunderstanding sometimes about freedom. And so we'll talk about that. But God of the universe is all about freedom. Right? He paid the ultimate sacrifice to set his creation free. From the bondage that we found ourselves in. From the bondage of self-centered living, God has set us free. We have been called. We have been invited we have even be, been compelled to live in this freedom that God has always desired for us to have. God wants us to live in this freedom. He, 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 I think sometimes God laughs at Americans. I mean, I just do. I think we're his favorite sitcom next to a few others. But, right, but I think he's like, you guys think you get freedom, but you don't. Because God does want to set us free from the bondage of self-centered living. In fact, self-centered living in our world, and, and you throw freedom in there, and it explodes, right? Because if it's all about self, and then you tell everybody that it's all about you, and then you say, and here's the good news. You live in America, so it's free to be all about you. Go have fun. That's where we're living. Yeah, pretty much. Because <laughs> we don't agree. We don't agree. Free, freedom is great. Uh, I remember as a, I was teaching Brookside Christian and um, high school. And so during Christian living class, which was lunch and then Christian living, so it was together. So they used to always come in and when it was spirit week, they would come in and take a picture of the kids who dressed up for spirit week. And they always did that in Christian living. And so I'm sitting there with, in the senior class, and the gal comes in to take the pictures of the kids who were dressed in uh, the spirit colors, whatever. Uh, and, and the students always loved it because it was uniform. And so whenever it was spirit week, they didn't have to wear their uniform. 
right? So it was like, yes, it's a free day, you know? So they'd wear jeans and just say whatever day that was. And so they just loved it. So these two girls that are in my class are sitting there. So the girl lady comes in, takes a picture, and says, okay, we need everybody out in the hallway, we're gonna take a picture. And the two girls are like, I don't take a picture. And she goes, you gotta take a picture. She goes, I don't want to, they go, I don't, I don't like having my picture taken. I'll stand in the back, but you have to have your picture taken. I don't wanna take my picture, right? And so she says, the lady that's taking the picture, the one that's running the whole thing, says, uh, you know, we ought to make it that if you, that you can't dress in uniform, I mean, you can't dress in the costume or dress down or not wear a uniform if you don't have your picture taken, right? That's part of Spirit Week. We have the freedom to say no. And so I told the girls, I said, and she has the freedom to expel you. <laughs> and they looked at me and I said, freedom's only great when you're the only one with it. <laughs> because she has freedom as well. Do you see where there's a conflict? <laughs> yes, you're right. You have the freedom to say no to your no teacher. And no they have the freedom to give you the consequence. That's right. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. We, and this, again, this is a problem with freedom. <laughs> we all go, it's so great to be free. It's like I always say about the, the, the purge, right? We've all seen that. Well, I don't know if we've all seen it. I don't recommend it, but anyway. Because no. um, that would be weird, a pastor recommending that movie. Go watch it. You'll know why I just said that. But anyway, <laughs> the premise is that one day of the year, they have decided that it's going to be a purge day. That means everybody can do whatever they want without any consequence. You know, like kill people that you don't like. You get the idea. So imagine if we had a purge. So there's times, I'm not going to lie, there's a few people that come to mind that I mind having a purge day, right? And uh, don't worry, it's not you, Elsa. But anyway, you. <laughs> not today, maybe tomorrow. All right. I'll behave. Right. So we always think like, that would be so great. But we always forget, you might be on someone's list. See, we think, well, I wouldn't be on anybody's list. But you fool are on a lot of people's lists, right? Because that's how we view freedom. This is how we view freedom, right? We have been compelled to live. You know that this is exactly what God wants for his creation. He wants us to actually be free. Because if, if you're living like what I was just joking about, you're in bondage. You're just in bondage to yourself. You're in bondage to what you want, to self-centered living. But God wants all of his creation to be free. Free ultimately to live as he lives and loves. Freedom to love. The moment Adam and Eve ate from the fruit, right, that God told them not to eat, they became enslaved in bondage. Adam and Eve before that was only enslaved to the one who had created them, God, who loved them. They only knew a life. They, were, they lived in absolute true freedom before they ate from the tree. They did, really. They, they, they were free and they, didn't, they were not uh, bond, in bondage and have all the things that we suffer with, it comes with getting to be our own God, which is ultimately what that tree that they ate from was going to give them. Right? I want to do it my way. I want to be my own God, the tree of death. We love our country, and we love to boast as often as we can that we live in the land of the free, but I think we forget we all live in this free country. As I told those girls, freedom is best when I'm the only one free. But we don't like the word, when I say we, I just mean the world we live in. We don't like language like enslaved, right? To be, to be in bondage or in submission, to don't tell me what to do, right? I will do and believe and think how I want to. I think some might say, I'm slave to no one. I answer no one but to myself. Then you're, then you're being mastered. Right? You are mastered. You are, you are being mastered. Everyone is mastered by someone or something. I don't know what it is for you. I hope and pray that, that it's God. Because there is no greater master in the universe than for God to be the one. Because he sees all, knows all, loves, I mean, that is, the, the life that Adam and Eve had is the life that, ev that God wants everybody to have. But we are living 
This is one of the reasons why I really felt compelled to share this message because in these last couple weeks, right, it's just been really hot topics going on. But we, we are living in a time of a war of freedom. Really, we are. And everybody's fighting to be free for what they believe. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? Everyone's fighting to be right. And we have the Constitution, right, that tells us we hold these truths to be self-evident. I have this up on the screen. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we tend to hear, I, we all have the right... Right? We all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we, this is like the, the trademark. This is what sets America apart from everybody else. Right? Is this. And we're all fighting. Remember what I was joking about before. If you take everybody and say, you do you. Right? My friend says, you do you, boo. <laughs> there you go. You do you, boo. Right? Everybody does you. But when you, you're doing you, steps on me, we got a problem. right? Or me steps on you, we got a problem. Because sometimes your right infringes on my right. Or my right infringes on, infringes on their right. We always see things from a very self-centered perspective. And we are living in a time in America where we are all fighting to be right. Let me let you in on the secret. <clears throat> There's only one who's right, yeah. and it's not you. <laughs> and don't worry, it's not your enemy either. It's God. <laughs> Thank the Lord for that. Thank you, Jesus. Right. He is literally the only one who is actually right. Who is actually right. But we as God's children, <laughs> Right? As God's ambassadors, as God's people, we must remember that we have been set free. Listen very carefully, and it's going to sound really sweet and look good on a bumper sticker, but it's the most challenging thing that we find to do. But we have actually been set free to love. And you go, oh, that's easy. Really? It looks like it's difficult. At least what I'm seeing on social media. It looks like it's challenging. Right? He has called us right, to be free to love, not to fight. Remember Jesus, who by the way, as I just said, uh, who by the way has the right and is right, set aside, listen very carefully, set aside his right to be right. Philippians 2. Jesus set aside his right to be right. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. Have you ever set aside your right to be right that somebody else may know Jesus? I know. Right? Yeah, yeah but it's like, is that a mountain you want to die on? Jesus set aside his right to be right. It's in Philippians 2. I didn't put it up there. Look it up. Right? We should have the same mindset, the same attitude. As Christ, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead setting aside his divine nature, taking on the role of a servant, a human, and, and being crucified. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Jesus set aside his right to be right so that you would come to his Father. But yet, that's not what we seem to be doing with the rest of the world. Paul says, you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Change the words around so it helps you a little bit. right? Don't use your freedom to satisfy your self-centeredness. It's not all about you. Right? I know we live in a culture that says it is, which is inflaming the fight. If we keep telling everybody it's all about you, do you understand? This is really, I, I mean, I, I could be a preschool teacher. This is so easy, mm -hmm. right? It's just so easy. But it says, don't use your freedom to stop. Instead, use the freedom that you have been given in Christ to do what? To serve one another in love. For the whole law is summed up in love your neighbor as yourself. 
God freed us to love, to love the way he loves. We're living in a time where too many people feel duty bound to declare the law of Christ to the world. But listen, very, and I understand that's, we want to, it's like, I'm fighting for you, God. And he's like, calm down. Jesus didn't even take that posture. In fact, the most angry Jesus got at, just so you know, wasn't the world. <laughs> it was Christians. Well, that's who he got really indignant over. He's like, you should know. They have an excuse. What's yours? Come on, yeah. right? Know this, God has not called us to declare or proclaim the law to the world. <laughs> I, I need you to sit with that for a minute. God has not called us to proclaim the law of God to the world. Nowhere in scripture. God has commanded us to be his witness, to be his agent of love and forgiveness to the world. That we have been commanded to. We have been commanded to love. We have been commanded to take the message of forgiveness. We have commanded to be the ambassador. We, Mark said in his prayer, to be salt and light in the world. Right? But somewhere along the way, we have gotten this idea that we have to fight for the things of God. And the best way that you can do that is live the way God wants you to live. Let your life be a living example. If it convicts somebody else, the Holy Spirit is doing that. Not you. Not you. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict the world of sin. It's in John 16. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. The word convict means to convince you are wrong. We are tirelessly trying to convince the world they're wrong. That's not your job. <laughs> That's, and so if you're frustrated in what you're doing, it's because you're doing something that God is not asking you to do. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. Will he use you? And some of you are like, yes, and the Holy Spirit is using me. And it's like, okay, calm down, soldier. Yeah, exactly. Put the cape away for the day, right? So I saw these two posts this week on Facebook. And I'm sorry, online, you don't get to see those because we're not really high tech. But anyway, um, join us next week, 1030. Um, but the first one says, and I'll, I'll describe it. It's, it was kind of cute. And so there's a picture of Jesus dragging a guy who's holding the Bible, yelling at some guy, clearly because he has a beard. Actually, the guy's wearing a Jesus shirt, so, or maybe that's a Darwin, Darwin. picture. Darwin. Never mind, that's a Darwin, that's not yeah. good. Okay. Oh, we got to get those people. We'll talk afterwards. We'll have a little meeting. Anyway, uh, but the picture says, right, I, Jesus is saying to the Christian as he's pulling him away, I called you to win souls, not arguments. Right? I like that. But what was interesting was the comment that the, somebody had put, and he, he, he or she could have been joking, I don't know. But it says, how does one win souls if one cannot win an argument? I thought, well, here's my question for you. Were you won by an argument? Were you won by an argument? Did somebody come up and convince you that you were a sinner headed to hell because of the way you live? And you went, gosh, that sounds awesome. How do I follow your Jesus? Right. I don't think that's anybody's testimony. I've heard a lot of testimonies. No testimony has ever been like that. No. Right? The next one says, uh, which, what's in the, oh, that was the next one. It says, God called you to be a witness, not a lawyer. God anointed you to win souls, not, not arguments. He called you to be a witness. Just be a witness to what God has done in your life. Stop being a lawyer trying to convict everybody for what they're doing in their life. Mm. Do you understand? Amen. That, that, that doesn't, again, not your job. Not your job. This is the other post I saw. It says, if you're using this scripture to do this, but not this, then you are not preaching the gospel. So there's a bunch of people standing over a guy um, with, I'm guessing, Bibles or whatever. And then it's a picture of Jesus who's reaching out and hugging somebody. And so essentially this idea that that nobody has ever been compelled, right? The love of Christ compels, not the law of Christ, right? Let, let me ask you, if you're a Christian, what drew you to Jesus? What drew you to God? Was it all the rules? Was it the laws, right? Did somebody sit down with you and say, okay, listen, 
super awesome program, Christianity, make note of it. And uh, so this is what we do, right? So any fun you're having, that's over. And um, yeah, you're gonna need to stop that habit. That's gonna go, that's not allowed. Uh, ooh, and I heard you talking the other day, you're gonna need to clean that up. Uh, yeah, you can't, nope, no, you can't do that. And you can't do this. And I mean, it's the way it is, you keep doing it, man. You're gonna go straight to hell. I mean, he's like, you're, you're an abomination. Like, ah, you're gonna burn. You wanna sign up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I think about it? I mean, how long is this? Well, I mean, you don't know. You could die today, burn tomorrow. It's like, oh, God, so it's like, okay. No, I got you. Sure, yeah. So I, I got to make the decision. Okay. Whew, wow. Uh, can I say no? I mean, you, I can assure you that is no one's salvation story. No. Right? That is no one. The love of Christ compelled you. I can assure you it was the love of Christ that compelled you to come to him. And more than likely, that came through an ambassador of God's love. I know it did for Mark and I. You've heard our story. Mark and I, I can assure you, did not come to Christ because the preaching was off the hook, the music was amazing, the building was great. We had no idea what that pastor was talking about. I was so confused. The worship team? Wow. Ugh. Oh, they're sweet. Oh, wow. That's Okay, now I see it. I don't even know what that song is. Yowza. Did you have anybody? I know there's only 20 of you, but God, somebody's got to be able to sing. I mean, it was horrible. And these were my best friends. They came to be my best friends. You know why? Because you know what made Mark and I say? Because the people loved us. I cannot tell you how many times my husband asked our pastor's wife to have a beer. And she continued to say no in love. It was amazing. One time he had all the beers set up because he was doing this whole thing where they had these flavored beers. You got to try them. It'll be fun. You sure you don't want to try it? Apricot beer. It's really good. And she goes, no, it's okay. No, thank you. We're done. Whatever. You want to smoke some weed in the back? It's going to be great. <laughs> it's like, and they're just like, that's okay. And then, but they ate with us and they sat with us and they loved us. And we're like, whatever. Like, yeah. You want to watch a movie? It's raw by Eddie Murphy. You're going to love it. <laughs> it's like, okay. Right? Delirious, whatever your Eddie Murphy movie is. Yes, but they love that. And if you still have that, you should repent this morning. But anyway. I don't have it. <laughs> but the love of these people is what kept us. It's what drew us to Christ. Right? Because the, somebody knew you needed to experience the love, grace, and mercy of God and knew that demanding that you live a certain way was probably not the way God intended you to come to him. Remember it said, for the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Let me tell you something. If you are a rules person, if you're consumed with the law, then know this. This is the highest form of the law. Love your neighbor. Paul tells us that love is the highest form of the law. And when focus your time and energy on continuing to love as often as possible, you will fulfill the law. Here's the thing. I actually think it's harder to love than to obey certain commandments. It is. It is. It is. It's a lot harder. Right? That's why we're struggling. Paul said, let no debt remain outstanding. I love the way he says that. Except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. And the NLT says, owe nothing to anyone except your obligation to love one another. Why? Well, we're commanded to. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law for the commandment. Say, you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Right? I mean, especially right now with some of the things that are going on, it's like, you know, it's, you know, it's a sin to murder. And you know what I'm talking about, what's going on in the world today. Right? But here's what I see sometimes. I see people going, you're such an idiot to think that that's not a sin to commit murder. Do you know that I just committed murder? Yes, you did. Jesus said I did. Because Jesus said, you've heard it said, don't murder, don't take a life. 
But I'm telling you that if you call someone a name, you're guilty of murder. So as we're standing on that approach, condemning somebody, yikes. My husband, by his own admission, says he is a serial murderer. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Just on the way to church, he probably kills at least three or four people. <laughs> Thanks be to God for your grace, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself sadly some of us justify our condemnation or our judgment on others with well who is our neighbor right i had somebody say that one time i had a guy in the church years ago say listen neighbor in that context when jesus says love your neighbor what he's talking about is like your wife and your children and those closest to you so that's who he's telling me to love I'm thinking, who are you not loving? Because <laughs> right. you're fine. Right? Justifying, right, who is our neighbor. And this is my answer that will make it very easy to always get it right with God. If you're ever in a situation like, I don't know, should I? Is he my neighbor? I mean, he's definitely not my brother, <laughs> not my <laughs> sister. I know that. He's not really my enemy. He's not, is he my neighbor? I'm not really sure. So this is my answer if you're ever wondering if this is my neighbor. Just love everyone. Right. Just love everyone. You are bound to hit a neighbor in there. Just love everyone. Jesus says love your neighbor, love your enemy, love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? He's, he really says love everybody. Right? In fact, I'm sure there's parts of God that goes, man, I probably should have wrote in a clause because I knew they'd write, split apart who the neighbor was. Right? And actually, there is a parable that you can spend some time looking at. It's a parable of the Good Samaritan. And so, so that you understand why the story, because basically what happens is somebody asks Jesus, and they're just trying to test him. The religious leaders who knew the law really well always tried to trip Jesus up because they wanted Jesus to be condemning. They wanted Jesus. They used to bring a woman caught in adultery. What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about that? And they're testing him. Come on, if you say you're God, then you know what she's doing is wrong. And you know the law says you need to kill her. So what are you going to do? Right? That's what they did. They test him all the time. And so on this one occasion, here comes this, this lawyer. right? And he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asked him, well, what is written in the law? Right? You're the expert. What's written in the law and how do you read it? That's an important context there. What is written and how do you read it? Right? And the law, right? Is this the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You guys, that's not New Testament. Mm -hmm. Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. That's in the Old Testament. Right? And so, of course, this good lawyer. He answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He knows the law. Good job. He says, you've answered correctly. He says, so do this and you'll live. There you go. Do that and you will live. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? Until you have to be around someone else. Freedom's only <laughs> great if you're the only one with it. Right? It's like people that live in some cave or some hut away from society, they're the best at loving others because there isn't any, right? And they don't have social media. But this lawyer wanted to justify himself, so he asked, but who is my neighbor? Right? And so this is the story that Jesus says. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. So here's this man that they probably can't even recognize where he's from or who he is, and he's dead, nearly dead on the side of the road. So here comes a priest, you know, a godly guy. He happens to be going down the same road. When he sees the man, he passes by on the other side. He crosses the street. I don't want to get involved. So to a Levite, again, this is from the priestly tribe, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by again on the other side and crossed over. But here comes a Samaritan. Now let's be clear in case you don't know about Samaritans. Samaritans, according to the Christians or Jewish people, uh, godly people, they were unclean and undeserving of God. 
And so they ignored Samaritans. They would not go to Samaria. They did not want to be uh, dirtied by them. They were considered unworthy. And so we didn't deal with Samaritans. So here comes a Samaritan. As he's traveling, he comes by where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil on them and giving him wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him there. Then the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. This is, this is a good Samaritan. So Jesus asked the lawyer, well, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, well, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Just, he didn't stop to inspect who he was. Right? He didn't check out his credentials. Right? And sometimes, again, we look at that story and go, I know Jesus wants us to be compassionate to those who are hurting and broken and all of those things. But why is it that we're not doing that? Well, because that person isn't hurting or broken. How do you know? How do you know? Oh, well, because you don't see the blood? You don't see a scar? How do you know? Right. We may not be, as I said last week, we may not be of this world, but we do live in it. And it's where God has placed us. And for what purpose has God placed us here? To show the world who he is, that they too may come and be reconciled that they too may truly be set free. Not free to be right, but free to love and live in harmony with each other. I can assure you what God sees going on in our country today rips his heart apart, and maybe not for the reasons you think. It's because we're biting and devouring each other to be right, and nobody is stopping to love to show compassion. Through him, Christ, Acts tells us that everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. What does that mean? It means you were not made right because of the law. See, God's people, the reason why they didn't recognize Jesus is because they, the Jewish people, the Israelites, knew to follow the law. They said, we're children of Abraham because we follow the law. We're going to heaven because we follow the law. We're God's people because we follow the law. And God says, no, you're not. It's not because you follow a law. Because if you could go to heaven by following the law, stay with me here. Boy, that sure was nice of Jesus. Why does Jesus need to die? Because we can't follow the law. And you go, well, I can follow it better than that fool. Okay. <laughs> You're still right. Yeah. One wrong on a test is a failure. Can you imagine? That's it. One wrong. You go, well, I would miss one. You missed, you know, 60. Yeah, you still got an F. Yeah, but my F's smaller than yours. What? Jeez, my name. Yeah, exactly. Let me, let me say this. If this is how we were saved, reconciled, right, then why would we think or expect anyone else to be saved any other way? If I was saved, if I was made right, right with God, if I was reconciled back to my creator who loved me and gave his only son for me, not because I changed any part of my life, right? That pastor's wife didn't come in and say, oh, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah, you're not you're not supposed to drink. You're not supposed to smoke. You're not supposed to do all those things. Oh, you're not supposed to watch that. Oh, you're not you're not you're not supposed to think that. Ooh, do you watch that? Oh yeah. Do you agree with that? You're not supposed to think like that. Because you're you're supposed to be do you want to be a Christian? I mean I'm just saying that's what you have to do. What? No, it's not. You don't become a Christian by being a Christian. Do you understand that? You become a Christian because you realize that Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross, descended into hell for you in your place, resurrected three days later, and you believe that with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. Welcome to Christianity. Amen. That's what makes you a Christian. Amen. But if I was saved, not because I changed any part of my life, not because I stopped sinning, not because I was good in any way, but only because of what Christ did for me, why is it that I would expect others 
to come to the saving knowledge of Christ, to be made right with their Creator God by obeying a set of rules, by being good or right as I deem. Why do I get to be saved by grace, but they have to be saved by the law? The love of Christ compels, not the law of Christ. If you want someone to love the law, I heard this one time, I'll hold her. Okay. Um, it'll be fine. She won't be distracting at all. Um, let me, I, I saw this one time, and I, I don't know where I heard it or saw it, but I loved it. I've always had it in all my quotes that I have. Um, but if you want someone to love the law, introduce them to the lawgiver. See, we want people to love the law. That's what we want them to do. You probably love, I hope you do love. If once you fall, once you fall in love with the lawgiver, can I tell you something? You will fall in love with the law. You will. Your perspective will change. How you see things will change. Certainly how you vote will change. How you spend your money will change. How you advocate for things will change. Absolutely, those things will change after you fall in love with the lawgiver. I don't fall. If you want that, introduce them to the lawgiver. Always keep in mind we have been set free to love as God loves us. Remember that Jesus set the example. He set aside his right to be right for the salvation of all. To set us free to do the same thing. We have been set free from the bondage of having to be right. You know what? It's okay if you're right. And here's what else is, it's okay. Nobody needs to know that. Somebody needs to hear that today. You can believe with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, but I know I'm right. It's like, okay. Just keep it to yourself. But people need to know. No, they don't. No, they don't. Satan is telling you that. Right? You actually have been set free from the bondage of having to be right. We have been set free from being offended. Somebody say amen. Amen. Boy, the world needs to get set free from that, right? It'll right. bring back a lot more comedians. But anyway, um, we have been, <laughs> I feel sorry for comedians. You know, I really do. People say to me all the time, you should be a comedian. It's like, then I won't be a Christian. But anyways, <laughs> so let it be fun for a moment. Uh, we've been set free from comparison. We're set free from complaining. From self-centered living, we've been set free from coveting. We've been set free to love, which is not always easy, I know. But I want to tell you that Jesus, it was really interesting. I thought of this this morning, and I was like, man, Jesus wrote seven letters to seven churches. And you can read those letters. They're in Revelations chapters 2 and 3 and find which church you go to. That's not an indictment against your church, because ours is great. And um, <laughs> but you might be in one of those churches. No. And so when you read it, it basically tells them, this is what you're doing great, but here's what I have against you. And so that's these are the seven letters. And by the way, only one out of the seven is getting an A. And this one isn't. But it's uh, Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, he writes this letter. So these are the words of him who holds, the, I, I didn't put it up on the screen, but you can look it up in Revelations 2. I think it's 1 through 6. So it basically begins with, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Essentially, it's Jesus. And Jesus says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. And you're going, all right, all right, I'm doing good, look at me. I knew all that fighting was going to pay off. And Jesus says, but I hold this against you. You have forgotten, you have forsaken the love you had at first. It's almost like Jesus is saying, you forgot you forgot that you were once a wicked person. You forgot that you too at one time were going to hell. And you forgot that I loved you in spite of that. And I died for you. It was while we were still wicked sinners, the Bible tells us, that Jesus died for us. He didn't wait for us to get an A on the test. He didn't wait for us to figure it all out. But he loved us and he gave his life for us. And so I think he says, that's great. 
You're standing for what I believe, and you're doing that. I can see that, that you're persevering in that. Sometimes it's hard. It's, let me tell you something, friends. It's going to get harder. It's easy to post what you believe. It's a lot harder to live it. It's a lot harder to live it. Right? And so we're going to have to start living in situations where we're going to have to say no to some invitations. Right? To not being a part of certain things. And we can do that in love without going on and on and explaining them why they should say no too. No. Just live for Christ. Let your life be an example before them. And if the Holy Spirit chooses to use your life to convince them of another way, then that's the Holy Spirit's job and not yours. And there's not a help wanted sign on the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's got it just fine without you. He's got it fine, just fine without you. I think too many Christians right now are on a mission to fight evil. But remember, God did not send us on a mission to fight evil. But instead to compel others to love through the love of Christ. If following the laws and rules are important to you, that's fine. Stay with me. Some of you, that may be it. I want you to work on following the one law that will cover all the others. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love everyone as God has loved you. As we close this morning, I want you to reflect and remember and kind of do a, a careful inventory. I always love that when David says, King David said in the Psalms, search my heart, search my heart, O God. See if there be any offensive way in me. And another version says, God, uh, do a careful examination of my heart. And so every time you hear a message, I'm going to have the team join me up here. Every time you hear a message, every time, whether that's in a song or something you see in your social media or your Bible apps or however you get messages from God, is there something there that may be like, ooh, God was talking to me. And this morning, I want you to reflect and ask God to search my heart. Because we are good-willed people who really want to stand up for our Jesus. We want to fight for our Jesus. And let me tell you, friends, I get it. I want to stand for my Jesus. It breaks my heart to see so many people living outside of God's design for their life. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'm not just talking about the obvious. Because it's not, let me tell you something, we can easily say, oh, that, that lifestyle is not God's design. That behavior is not God's design. That is not God's, we can say all those things, but can I tell you something? Condemnation is not God's design for your life. Name calling is not God's design for your life. Greed is not God's design for your life. Gossip is not design, God's design for your life. Coveting, wanting what everybody else has, is not God's design for your life. There is so many people living outside of God's design for our life. And you have to ask yourself, am I? Not the person next to me, not the people I work with, not all my millions of friends on social media, but am I living outside of God's design? Because God died for you because he loves you. He loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would entrust their life to him, they would not die apart from him, but would instead come to know him and his son, Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Do you, do you hear any condemnation in that? And even if you do, let me tell you what John 3, 17 says. There, right? Jesus did not come to condemn the world. Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's wonderful, and we stand on that. But you understand, I can stand on that promise as I stand up here right now. There is no condemnation for me because my life is hidden in Christ. Not because I've done anything, because he has done everything. Amen. That's why there's no condemnation in my life. But what compelled me was the love of Jesus that I experienced through some people who were willing to sit and watch some crazy shows, drink a whole lot of beer, whatever it took to get Mark and I, right, to hear. Right? Some of you are like, sweet, we can do that? No. So <laughs> that's the only thing you'll hear this morning. It's like, I'm going home and calling up a few friends. <laughs> this 4th of July, spend some time reflecting 
on the freedom to love. The freedom to love. Jesus died to give you that freedom. Let's not let his life be killed in vain. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you, God, for your incredible love for us. For your unwavering favor. Your undeserved favor that you give us, Lord. Our we do not deserve the favor that you give us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, that we accept that grace. We accept that undeserved favor. But forgive us, God, when we are very selfish with it. You gave us that grace. You gave us that mercy. You gave us that forgiveness. You give us your love so that the world will experience your grace, your mercy, your love, and your forgiveness. So Lord, I pray that each and every one of us leave here today with a new mission, a mission to love, a mission to share your light with the world by how we live our own life. May it be a living testimony to who you are, Christ, in us. And may that compel the world to know you, Lord. We pray all these things this morning in your name. Amen.